Greetings, my brothers and sisters at U.S. Cal at this great gathering in Atlanta. My profound apologies that I am not able to be present uh, due to extenuating circumstances here at home. Uh, but I do want to share my heart relative to the topic of leaders and self-care with the hopes that it will provide some valuable and important tools for all of us who as leaders and as pastors are involved in the day-to-day -day work of caring for the sheep. One of the things that um, I want to read to us is a really well-known portion of Scripture, and then I want to look at it in a separate translation. But Jesus in Matthew chapter 11, verse 25, it says, At that time, I, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for thus was well-pleasing in your sight. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal him. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I am mindful of the fact that the great D.A. Carson often has said, and we've all quoted it perhaps, a text out of context is a pretext for a proof text. And so often we lift portions of this passage of Scripture out of context and turn it into an altar call. When in actual fact it's an invitation to something far deeper and far more profound, especially for a leader. First and foremost, I want to read you from verses 28 to 30 the words of Eugene Peterson's The Message. Now, I realize Eugene Peterson took a lot of flack for writing The Message, and there are Reformed purists who find great fault with it. I have a deep, profound respect for Eugene Peterson and have for many decades. I have sat and listened to him over and over again. I consider him one of those great pastoral voices whose sound theology has been grounded in dealing with the day-to-day -day human experience that people go through. And in his own personal life, the way he has cared for his own journey uh, is an example that I would say that all of us would learn well by listening to his teachings um, to follow. But in his portion of this scripture, he says, Are you tired, worn out? burned out on religion, come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. My beloved brothers and sisters, we live in an adrenaline rush culture. And as pastors and leaders, we personally have to learn first how to care for ourselves if we are to truly care for those that God has entrusted to us to care for. I was listening to some young preachers on television the other night, and I was deeply concerned over their conversation about ministry as a vehicle for career advancement. I don't know when the call to pastoring became something that now has driven us to 15 minutes of fame. I don't know when that happened in this past number of years but it has skewed our ability to understand that we are here to feed the sheep, 
to care for the sheep, to provide the kind of adequate nurturing and nourishing that enable them to have a deeply profound experience on an ongoing basis with God. The challenge with us as preachers is that while we may react to a young generation that calls preaching an opportunity for a career advancement, we also are quite professional at what we do. We know how to crank out sermons. We know how to make the crowd get excited. We know how to do all sorts of things that kind of make church work. And yet the danger in all of that is that we can miss God by a mile because we have so perfected the art of pulpiteering that our lives are shallow and empty, not because we're not studying, not because we're not doing the work, but because we ourselves ignore the very mandate of Jesus in this passage. And here's what I want to say about D.A. Carson's term uh, text. Uh, a text without a context is a pretext for a proof text. We always jump to come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and we turn it into an altar call. Well, maybe it needs to be an altar call, but an altar call that alters leaders into a whole new place of self-care. Because it opens with these words, at that time Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to babes. I want to suggest to you that the weary and the heavy laden that are in verse 28 are the wise and the intelligent Jesus is addressing in verse 25. And I think sometimes as servants of Christ, we handle the book so much, we know the text so well, that we deceive ourselves into thinking that because we know the text, we know the one whom the text is speaking of. And we offer our study, we offer our effort and our labor without the real ongoing personal intimacy that requires getting away from it all and learning those unforced rhythms of grace. I have a saying that I have used many times with the leaders that I touch as well as with our own congregation. And it's these words, based on the phrase Jesus said, freely you've received, freely give. We're always giving. We're always giving. But I wonder how much we are in the posture of learning how to receive. And here's what I often say. You can't give what you don't have. You can't have what you haven't done. You can't do what you haven't been. You can't be what you haven't believed. You can't believe what you haven't received, and you can't receive what you haven't been given, so you can't give what you don't have. And you can go through that entire statement and break it down piece by piece and come right back full circle to, I can't give what I don't have. And in an adrenaline rush culture, leaders first and foremost need to invest in rest. When you think about your schedule, when I think about my schedule, and all of us have pretty full schedules, we rise up early, we go to bed late, and oftentimes we ignore the fact that we just might be eating the bread of painful labors because we're so used to doing so much that we have forgotten how to be in the presence of God. One of the things that Eugene Peterson often talks about is pastoral Sabbaths. Now, I'm going to tell a story. I'm, I'm going to uh, be very guarded and respectful because it was a story that was personally told to me by his son, Eric, uh, who is also a Presbyterian pastor. And Eric said that it was tradition in the Peterson household that at breakfast time, they would all sit together at breakfast. And this was 
during that season when Eugene Peterson was pastoring a church he pioneered in Baltimore called Christ the King Church. And so breakfast was always family time. And one morning, while Eugene was preparing breakfast, uh, Eugene's wife was preparing breakfast, Eugene hadn't come up from the basement in time, and so Mama sent little Eric down to get Eugene for breakfast. And Eric shared this story with me. He said, Mark, he said, I went downstairs in the basement. My dad made it a practice every day of his life that when he would get up, he would go down in the basement. But I didn't know what he was doing in the basement till that morning. And he said, I went down in the basement that morning, and there was my father rolled up in a prayer shawl, rocking back and forth with the Psalms opened, reading and praying the Psalms and seeking God's face for what God would have him do for the day. He said, it left an indelible impression on me about my dad's seriousness about his own personal ability to receive from God so he could give to those he pastored. And I know that it can become really easy for us to get into a performance mode as leaders. And we are so good at performance that we oftentimes neglect the weightier matters of our essence because we are not called to be human doings. We are called to be human beings. And I'm learning late in life how to slow down to the speed of life. I've burned the candle at both ends for a long time. I paid a high price for it in a season that I didn't see coming. Had I saw it coming, I could have averted it, but I was so preoccupied with being busy for God that the notion of self-care seemed less than spiritual. And yet, God is the one who invites us to Sabbath. And we can get so spiritual and say Christ is our Sabbath, and I certainly agree with that, and yet ignore the reality that there is a rhythm to creation. And we live in a seven-day week, not because some Roman emperor decided there were seven days in a week, but because the Creator, in creating that which is the creation, established a rhythm that included a seventh day of rest, where out of that place of rest there could be recreation. Out of that place of rest, there could be renewal. Out of that place of rest, there could be refreshing. Out of that place of rest, there could be restoration. Restoration comes from rest. They have done scientific studies. The Heart Math Institute, uh, Doc Lou Childers Institute, that certifies counselors in the art of living a compassionate life. Uh, something done in the secular world that you wonder how come we as pastors and leaders aren't necessarily looking at things that the secular world is looking at as qualities that are to be cultivated for self-care. And in the HeartMath Institute, they, they invite people to learn how to practice compassion both for others and for themselves. But in order to practice compassion, you have to come to a place of being able to receive it. Well, you and I know the source of compassion is Christ himself. And so to get in the yoke with Jesus, to take his yoke upon us, knowing that his yoke is easy and his burden is light, we, we often wear the collars when we preach. Well, the collar is a yoke. It means I'm yoked with Christ. And yet so often we have reduced everything we do to a schedule that demands urgency for every single thing. And yet when it comes to self-care, we seem to ignore it until we get into places where it catches up to us and our bodies tell us they're not going where our minds want to go. 
There was a book written, uh, a psychological book written a number of years ago called The Body Is the Unconscious Mind or the Subconscious Mind. I can't remember quite the title. But when it came out, I was studying psychology uh, at a graduate level, and I, and I read it, and it provided insight on learning how to pay attention to our bodies. Now, I may be saying things that are old news for many of you, uh, but since this was the topic that was entrusted to me, I, I, I really feel like I, I want to share these things because they're really important. Um, but we operate in an adrenaline rush culture where the rapid pace of accelerated change drives our need for more and more and more and more information. We have become information gluttons. And sometimes we can treat this book as if it's chock full of information. And we can search it from end to end, and it's wonderful to search it. It's an amazing book. I grow more star starstruck by what's in the book the older I get. I remember Judson Cornwall telling us when we were in Bible school that we need to eat the book based on Ezekiel being told to eat the scroll and John the Revelator being told to eat the book in the book of Revelation. And Judson did a whole thing on eating the book. And I want to eat the book. I want to be a man of the book. I want to be a person of the book. I, I want to hold the book in high regard, and I do. But I also know that in the book, Jesus said, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, but you refuse to come to me. And I have found in my journey that it's easier to go to the book and look for stuff than it is to pull back and just get quiet and come to the place of what I call the quiet, where I learn how to receive so that I can give. I'm hungry at this season of my life for something beyond what we've had. I'm hungry for something more than what we right now are calling church. I see that we're in a day where transitions are impacting our view of the scripture, our view of the church culture. It has become popular to demonize the church for which Christ died, his bride. And God help us that we should honor the church for which Christ died. This is his bride and we have been called to serve his bride so that she can be presented to him without spot and blemish. But in order to do that, we need him to minister to us. We need him to pour into us. I've been reading the lives of some of the great saints of God that have been mightily used of God lately. I've gone back and looked at John G. Lake. I've gone back and looked at A.B. Simpson. I've gone back and looked at Dr. Charles Price, who was one of my heroes. I have every copy of The Golden Grain. I have an autographed copy of Dr. Charles Price's book, The Story of My Life. I, he was long dead by the time I was in Bible school, but there was an old Norwegian couple that knew I quoted him often, and they gave me a paper bag filled with copies of The Golden Grain from 1929 to 1933 and the story of his life that he personally autographed for them. They gave it to me the day I was licensed to preach the gospel back in Brooklyn in the early 1980s. But all of them, Charles Price, John Lake, A.B. Simpson, all came to a place in their life having moved in tremendous power having moved in great grace, having moved in the demonstration of the Spirit, all of them came to a place where they said it wasn't enough, that what they all needed, John Lake put it best. He said, and I'm paraphrasing, he said, I got to a place where I had seen thousands and thousands healed. I had the mind of God when I laid hands on people and could tell what their conditions were. He said, but I got bored and I got 
I, 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 I want to say worn out. I'm trying to remember the exact words he used. And he said, I realized what I needed for myself was a fresh baptism from the ascended glorified Christ. A.B. Simpson said the Holy Spirit told him, your problem is that you can't receive from me because your dogmatics has gotten in the way of our relationship. And that's another paraphrase. Charles Price, who wrote The Real Faith, said beyond when you get to the last chapter in the book on the real faith, he said the real issue is allowing Jesus, the Christ, to give himself in you and through you. And that requires being in a place of letting him minister to you. That Christ in you, Christ in me, the hope of glory, requires we learn to receive from him. There are about ten psalms written by the sons of Korah. Now, we all know who the sons of Korah were. They were the sons of one man who rebelled against God and by which God allowed Moses to speak a word. The earth opened up and swallowed up Korah in his rebellion with those that rebelled. I often go to those ten psalms to make sure my heart is right when I feel like there may be areas where I'm rebelling against God uh, in the things that I'm determined to do, not necessarily checking and seeing if everything I'm doing is coming from performance or am I flowing out of the essence of receiving from Christ and then giving what I've received. And those psalms are a cure for self-effort. Those psalms by the sons of Korah are a cure for performance-driven, restless energy. Those psalms are a, are, are a cure for the adrenaline, adrenaline rush culture and generation we're living in. And in Psalm 46, we all know it, the sons of Korah wrote that psalm. And in Psalm 46, verse 10, it says, Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know. I, I look at that and I, I understand that in the Hebrew it means let go, relax. And we've all heard let go and let God. And yet, my dear brothers and sisters, the hardest thing for us as pastors is to let go. We are more often holding on because we feel like everything depends on us. Unconsciously, now we may consciously give credit to God, but deep inside, we suffer from having been caught in the trap of over-responsibility. And we end up believing it all depends on us. And we don't know how to let go. And when you don't know how to let go, you don't know how to let come. Because until I let go, I can't let come. And so be still and know is a progression. Until I'm still, revelation knowledge can't come. Now these are all obvious things to us. We all know these things. I'm sharing these out of my heart at a season in my life where I am feeling the cry as a pastor of wanting to feed the sheep as best I can in a culture that seems to have watered down the gospel to something far less than receiving the life of Jesus. But if all I do is give them my studies, if all I do is give them my intellectual apprehension of a text, if all I do is give them the labor of my hours of perfecting the craft of preaching. I failed. Judson Cornwall made a statement to us in Bible school years ago. He said, we are called to be adequate ministers of a new covenant, ministers of the Spirit. He said, we're not called to be ministers of our intellect or anything like that. But he said, we're called to be ministers of the Spirit. We are called to minister 
the Spirit. And he was speaking from 2 Corinthians 3 and 4. And he said, he said, for me, the acid test is not whether the guy on the front row who always says amen is getting what I'm saying. He's saying, but if the person that sits way in the back that's half asleep and doesn't pay attention to a word or two that I say until they get God's spirit from me, I have not adequately ministered. And he said, they can't get God's spirit from me unless I am receiving from God myself. Worship has become an art form in the current culture. We pride ourselves on our worship teams and we pride ourselves on our ability to produce excellence in music and I'm all for it. I want excellence. David commanded us in the Psalms that we're to be excellent in our praise and excellent in our worship. And yet I also know worship isn't just something we do. Worship is something we become. And I am at a place in my life, and I invite you to just weigh this out for yourself, where I'm asking God to teach me all over again how to come to Jesus and how to learn the unforced rhythms of grace so that in the presence of Jesus, the ascended glorified Savior, I might receive more of his spirit so that rather than relying on my wisdom and my intelligence, I discover that God gives things to me when I become a babe because my wisdom and intelligence can be the very thing that causes God to hide things from me because I'm too smart for my own good. But when I become a babe, the best thing a babe can do is open their arms and receive. And Jesus basically says, I'm a babe. Get in the yoke with me. I do nothing but what I see my father doing. I say nothing but what I hear my father saying. Now, ironically, Jesus, who makes those statements in the Gospel of John, sounds like he's being passive. And yet at the end of John's Gospel, John says, I suppose if we were to write all the things that Jesus did, the world couldn't contain the volumes. So Jesus' statement, I do nothing but what I see my Father doing, born out of him being in the yoke of total dependency on the Father, continually receiving from the Spirit, brought him to a place of what I'm going to call effortless ease, where the flow of the life of the Spirit came out of him because he was in a continual place of receiving what God the Father wanted to give him. And when we get in the yoke with Jesus, we get into a place of genuine self-care because we are now in a posture of receiving the compassion, which is never helpless, because it moves us to accomplish things in a power greater than ourselves. My beloved brothers and sisters, may we in this season come to a place of understanding self-care that the best investment you can make is rest in God. There remains, therefore, a Sabbath rest for the people of God. I've not always entered that rest. I'm at a season in my life where I want to. And I believe if I can be faithful to enter that rest, I believe I will accomplish more in these days than I have in all the days I've served him so far. The ascended glorified Christ wants to do something fresh in our generation. He wants to do something fresh in every one of our lives. I pray that we would make room for him to do that and not be too smart for our own good, but to come apart, to come to him, get in the yoke with him, so that God the Father by the Holy Spirit can disclose to us what wants to happen according to John 16, 13. We haven't gotten to the future yet. If we'll take care of ourselves, he might take us there. I love you.